All right, well, we're in uh, Romans chapter 15. We're going to look at the first 13 verses. Uh, the title of the message is The Goal is Unity. And this is actually, you might say, the third part of a series that we began a few weeks ago as we hit chapter 14. This is one of those occasions where there's a very unfortunate chapter break. The chapter break should really, chapter 15, should begin at verse 14 uh, because we're still in the same uh, subject matter. Back in chapter 12, we began the practical aspects uh, of the book of Romans and, uh, and the need to have our lives totally get it, dedicated to the Lord like a whole burnt offering. This is kind of the image there, complete dedication. And then we moved into uh, the principles and a definition that Paul gives us of what real genuine Christian love really is. Uh, and then we talked about the fact that he introduces us to this idea of spiritual gifts. And then primarily those spiritual gifts need to operate also then in an atmosphere of love. Uh, and they're primarily for the edifying and building up of others, a subject that we're going to look at again this morning. Uh, there was a concern that we're all in submission to the governing authorities and those authorities that God has uh, established, whether we like them or, or not, uh, that we might live peaceable lives, that our lives might be a witness to those uh, around us. And then we dealt with this whole area of when we disagree. Uh, and that was the title of our message a, a few weeks ago. When we disagree in disputable matters or doubtful matters, depending upon your translation of verse 1 of chapter 14. It's not when we disagree over doctrinal issues. Uh, there are the essentials of the faith that we have to agree on. It's not when we disagree on something that's covered in the Bible, whether that's a sin or not. No, the Bible says it's a sin. It's a sin. Uh, but it's when other areas, and of course in this church that was at this point in time predominantly Jewish, it would appear, because we don't even have a reference to Gentiles until we get to, uh, to chapter 11, and it has a, a Jewish flavor all the way through, but there were Gentiles. So those Gentiles didn't really care about certain days to be worshipped on, certain days to honor God on. They didn't really care if uh, the ribeye they got at the, at the uh, local butcher shop had a sign on it that said, previously offered to Zeus. They knew that was the best meat, and that's what they bought. It didn't bother them. They didn't give it a second thought. But to most of the folks in that church, their Jewish brothers, that was not good. That was not good. In fact, many of them, had, if they couldn't know for sure the meat wasn't kosher, they would, they would uh, not eat it. They would become the, uh, the vegetarian that day rather than stumble themselves, like Daniel did in the Babylonian captivity, for example. Uh, it would bother them, though, the liberty uh, that their Gentile brothers have in those kinds of things. Well, it's not issues of days and, and, and eating meat, although you actually have that, uh, of course, out there in the body of Christ. But for the most part, it's, uh, it's other things and other issues uh, and many of those practical things that uh, we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so we covered principles, and if we followed them, uh, we would know when and how to deal with those issues when we disagree. Uh, again, this message, the goal is unity. That's his final final push here. Uh, there's a story told of two congregations that were in a small town, and both of them were kind of dwindling in number and kind of dwindling in finances, and they uh, decided that uh, the best thing for both of them would be to merge into one congregation. And uh, uh, it's a difficult uh, thing to do, and, uh, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but in this case, uh, uh, one thing held them up from mer merging. Uh, their worship was the same. The essential beliefs were the same. Uh, but both had the tradition on occasion to say the Lord's Prayer together out loud as a congregation. One of the congregations prayed, uh, and Lord, forgive us our debts. But one of the other church prayed, and Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Uh, and they couldn't ever come to agree which of those words they would use in the Lord's Prayer, and so they were never able to merge uh, together as two churches into one. A secular reporting, a reporter covering the story said uh, in the end uh, that one church went back to its trespasses and the other one went back to its debt. <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately, it's the little things, the crazy things like this that sometimes keep us from having uh, unity uh, in the church. Again, the principles we've gone over so far uh, back two weeks ago is the need to accept one another, just to simply accept one another. After all, Christ has accepted us, and that our allegiance belongs completely to the Lord. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is always an issue, 
uh, when there's a disagreement. Uh, and Paul's there, there at the end of that passage is that in the end, we're all accountable to the Lord. None of us will have to stand before Jesus Christ one day and give an account for someone else. And whether they live according to their convictions or not, we're all going to stand uh, on our own. Last week, we looked at the fact that uh, our actions uh, affect other people. The phrase that Paul uses is that, uh, that we can do things that actually stumble other people for whom Christ died. Uh, that glass of Cabernet Sauvignon in the restaurant might be really good, but the guy that's watching you over there uh, that knows that you're a believer and he's a believer, that might be a problem for him. It might be an issue for him. Uh, that's a modern day example, and I appreciate everybody came back last week and some of you are still wearing <coughs> slippers, which is amazing after all the toes I stepped on in that last <laughs> message last week. Uh, but uh, uh, disputable issues, gray areas, things that are not covered uh, in the Bible. Our actions can impact other people. We must make every attempt to walk in love. And, uh, and we're going to see that again in this message as well. It should be our aim to be at peace with each other. Uh, and of course, in the end, our last point last week, all of us have got to live according to our own convictions. And we cannot take our convictions and try to put them on someone else, uh, nor can they uh, to us, and it's wrong to attempt uh, to do that. We talked about the fact that uh, in some parts of the country, it's an issue whether you smoke or not, but in other parts, it's no big deal. Uh, sometimes these standards are culture to different parts of the United States, and sometimes they're by denominational lines, and we gave you a few examples of, uh, of those as well. But we've all got to live according to our own convictions. So some problem, some people, it's a problem if, uh, if a guy's got all tatted up and has got all kind of piercings, uh, and then there's other places uh, where it's not a problem. In fact, uh, I just described several Calvary Chapel pastors to you, you know, in Southern California. It really varies. It's a crack up. It's a crack up to go to a Calvary Chapel pastor's cover. I just have to tell you that. There's a few guys that are kind of, kind of really dressed up and everything. And I remember the first time Pastor uh, Bill uh, invited Kathy and I and flew us to Southern California for a pastor's conference. It was at uh, Pastor Chuck's church. <laughs> I was just building windows for a living. My wardrobe consisted of work boots, uh, jeans, and several t-shirts, uh, and a few pairs of surf shorts, because that's about all I needed. Had a couple of law shirts when I had to meet with an architect or somebody, but that was, uh, was about it. I went out and bought some slacks and some new shoes, and I bought a couple of nice shirts and everything so I could go to the pastor's conference. Wow, was I in a shock. I get there, and people are in shorts, and they're barefooted, and they got t-shirts on, and this is back in the day when a lot of guys still had ponytails and stuff, and it's just like, wow, okay, I'm losing the wardrobe the next day, and then going casual. It was uh, just a different, uh, different kind of world, because I've been to other pastors' conferences, and it's coat and tie, <laughs> and uh, you can have uh, people frown on you if you show up uh, in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, so I... I adjust, I make a cultural adaptation because I don't want attention drawn to me. I want to blend in. I'm just there to receive the word and what the Lord has for us. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Uh, in the end, we all live according to our own convictions, but the goal of you is unity. The first three verses, we're gonna say that the practice, our practice should be living for others. That's very clear. Paul says, we then who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each, let each of us please his uh, neighbor for his good, leading to edification for even Christ and not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So the practice includes certainly uh, living to, to please others. Christian love, God's love that he gives off, is not self-centered, it's not selfish, it's others-oriented. Uh, uh, again, NIV maybe helps us this idea of scruples. Well, what, what do scruples mean? NIV says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. And we talked about, again, the liberty we have in Christ that should always be balanced with the love that we have for Christ and for, uh, for others. Uh, we should be living, actually, others-oriented life, like the life of Jesus. Paul will mention him as the example here in just a moment, uh, but uh, not the self-centered life. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, Paul says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. And if they're in the church, there's going to be, well, there won't be any unity. 
If people are all about me, if my three favorite people are me, myself, and I, we're going to have disunity. Uh, God's never going to be properly worshipped uh, nor, nor glorified. Uh, it's a spiritually mature person uh, that uh, lives to please others. Paul says this in, uh, in Acts 20, verse 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus he said, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And, th and this is the model of Jesus, to, to live not for yourself or for other people. Uh, as we've said on many occasions, uh, living to be happy is not the way to be happy. Uh, and if you're not sure about that, just watch the news at night or uh, watch uh, multi-million dollar super athletes or stars and so forth that seem to be have it all and live for themselves uh, and you will not find a happy person. Uh, it's living to please others, the weak, that you can help uh, and be blessed in that way. We talk about the fact that uh, uh, an appropriate illustration is parents. Uh, you start having kids and, uh, and all of a sudden you have to adjust many things in your life to please uh, not that you give it to everyone, but you live in a, such a way that uh, it's going to work for you and your family uh, and your, for your kids. Often it's uh, a dietary change. Uh, you go from eating at your favorite French restaurant to the Scottish restaurant down the street. You give up on Jacques in the Box in order to go to McDonald's because they've got a playground. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, we were the same way. You know, when we have kids, you know, they're not going to eat candy. We're not going to go to McDonald's. We're like, yeah, after a while, it's like survival. Yeah, let's go to McDonald's. That playground, we'll get like a cup of coffee. We'll actually have five minutes for a conversation before somebody falls and gets hurt. You, know, you make adjustments. You make adjustments for survival's sake. So you can have unity in the family and in your marriage sometimes. Uh, and that's the idea here, living for others. Notice that it's the strong that makes the adjustment. Verse 1, we then who are strong uh, ought to bear again with the weak. Now the weak don't uh, get an exemption from this. Well, I can do everything I want because I'm weak, so live with it. No, I mean, we're, we're all, we're all uh, seeking to have unity in the church, but the burden seems to be upon those, again, that, that feel they have more liberty as opposed to legalism because that, that's kind of the other thing that's going on. Uh, the weak person is not weak in terms of their ability and faith in God and their ability to believe in God and what he can do in and through their lives and so forth. Uh, that's not the weakness. <clears throat> the weakness is not in their moral behavior. Their weakness is in their understanding of the grace of God primarily. And so they feel they have to look a certain way and do certain things that are not covered in the Bible in order to be truly walking with the Lord. Doesn't make us man pleasers. We don't have to be nice guys to accommodate somebody else's sin. Uh, these are things that are not covered in the Bible, but it's up to the strong to make the adjustment to help the weak. It's to please, but also, secondly, notice it's to edify others. Uh, we are to change our lifestyle in verse 2 for his good, leading to uh, edification, uh, to build them out up. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's not an optional thing. Ought to bear with the failings of the weak uh, is the idea of the old English, we owe, we owe this. It's in a sense, it's an imperative, it's a command, it's what we need to be, be doing. Paul's mentioned uh, this back in chapter 14, verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. And so therefore, when we run into another believer at the shopping center uh, at Safeway, <laughs> wherever it might be, out in the hallway, the first thought that comes to my mind should be, how can I, what can I do, what can I say to help build this other person up spiritually? We might have our disagreements on their liberty over certain issues. It's up to me to see what I can do to put them first in my life. How can I build them up? How can I make them stronger uh, in their faith in Jesus Christ? And just as a, a side, I just want to note that that sometimes is very difficult if I haven't spent any time with the Lord. If I haven't spent any time in the Word, if God's not working in me and showing me, sometimes I, I kind of want to do that, but I'm just really not even sure what to say, as opposed to, hey man, great to see you. You know, the Lord was just showing me so much, encouraging me in this and the Word today, and you know, and God is so good, and uh, you know, we need to be building each other up. Uh, that should be our thought, uh, how to please, how to build uh, each other up, and then thirdly, and obviously, 
The practice includes following the example of Christ, verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. Uh, and again, he. Uh, I want to go through just a, a couple of references is the obvious, uh, that Christ left heaven, uh, came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, uh, went uh, and uh, to the garden and prayed, if there's another way, if there's another way, then take this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Uh, and he goes and he knows he's going to get beat to a pulp. He didn't do that to please himself. He knew he was going to be nailed to a cross. He didn't do that to please himself. Uh, Christ becomes the example. Uh, well, I don't know if I really should give that up. You know, it's kind of a sacrifice. Yeah, I think that's the word. Uh, and then let's think about what that sacrifice is compared to, well, that's Paul's point. Uh, Jesus is the ultimate example of, for even Christ did not please himself. Uh, in John 8, 29, there Jesus says, I always do what pleases him in terms of God the Father. John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. In John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And here Paul quotes Psalm 69, 9, when he says, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And, uh, uh, to go back and read that in its context, uh, it's uh, here's the Messiah saying, the reproaches that fell on you, God, now have fallen on me. Uh, I've taken them. I've accepted them because I'm not living to please myself. Isaiah says of Jesus when he would go to the cross, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Uh, Ken Hughes says that whenever we crush the bread of communion between our teeth and swallow the cup of his blood, we cannot escape the fact that he did not please himself. He becomes the uh, ultimate example. And of course, the parallel passage with the uh, Philippians 2, uh, you know, vividly portraying to us this very principle. Uh, there, Paul writing, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, that's our concern, having the same love, being of one accord, I use the same terminology here in our Romans passage, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or, or conceit. Some translations would say vain conceit or empty conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Why? Verse 5, let this mind be in you, that he's just described, which was also in Christ Jesus. NIV says, let this attitude be in you, that was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, he's the example. A couple things we can learn from this passage that I want to kind of enumerate, because it's, uh, it's very powerful. Uh, first, we need to see when it says, uh, if... Uh, it's in a special class, and it means if and it is so, or we would use the word since. So these are foregone conclusions. Since you have encouragement from being united with Christ. And we should be. We should be encouraged. Uh, how can we have the attitude of Christ? Well, it should be an encouragement, the fact that we've been uh, united to him through the Holy Spirit. Peter tells us the same thing in 1 Peter 2.21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. It's kind of hard to say we're followers of Jesus Christ, but we don't really want to act like him. <laughs> we don't want to have that kind of attitude. Uh, but, uh, but we should. And it brings unity to the body of Christ. Since you have comfort from his love. This word means tenderness. It means to speak closely with. Uh, it's a picture of someone has died. Uh, your friend is there. It's someone they know. It's someone they're close to. To them, and you come and you speak closely with them. You're you're mourning with those who are mourning. You're weeping with those that are weeping. That's the word. That's the word that God says He has for us. Paul says, since you have that kind of comfort from Jesus Christ, from God, that you have the fellowship with Him, since you have that kind of comfort, uh, since you have fellowship uh, uh, again uh, with the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is what really binds us together. Uh, the life of the life of humility in doing this is not the natural life. You know, we just don't uh, uh, show up uh, uh, very often uh, and think, uh, "Oh man, what a blessing to see everybody here!" And uh, I'm just so humbled to be in their presence. And 
I sure hope there's something I can do to edify others. You know, th th that's where we want to get to. That's not our natural life. Our, our natural life is, uh, is worried about me and my deal and my thing. Uh, but uh, uh, we have fellowship with, with the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit makes us one. Uh, we have the comfort of His love, the encouragement of being united with Him. And if we have uh, uh, His tenderness and His compassion. Where tenderness can also be re uh, translated compassion. And, and the gospel speak over and over of the, of the compassion that Jesus Christ had. As he looked over to the multitudes and had compassion on them because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Uh, as he sees a, a woman and her sons died and this funeral is going by. He has compassion, so he goes and prays and raises the, the, the young boy up, up from the dead. Jesus did a lot of miracles to authenticate his messiahship. But once that season was over, he continued to do miracles simply because he had great compassion for, for people. Uh, it's, uh, it's a word that means to have uh, tender mercy. Uh, it's also the idea to have pity upon and recognize where people are at. Uh, and certainly we need to do that with not just our brothers and sisters, but everyone that's out there in the world and see their greatest need, which is to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A number of years ago when Strat uh, Goodhue, uh, our brother-in-law, former social pastor here, uh, was uh, on staff with us. His grandmother, uh, who was uh, alive at the time, and uh, she's now with the Lord, known as she was at, at Arcadia, which is uh, kind of a, a rest home, uh, nice place, <laughs> down by down by Punahou. We'd go down and actually have dinner with him. a really nice dining room there. And uh, you can meet all the important people of Hawaii that are uh, older and living there. And... Uh, of which she was, and uh, we went down and we'd have dinner with her once in a while, and she was, uh, 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 Strat's like fourth generation, you know, in the island, so uh, his grandmother, she had stories, and so uh, it was always great to go down and, and see Noni. Uh, and Strat would go off uh, as often as he could. He told me one time the Lord came, uh, kind of gave him a vision, being there with uh, all of the uh, older folks. He goes, it's like God showed him there, there's a clock around their neck, and the clock is ticking. <laughs> And he recognized, he saw them differently than other people because they had such a short time left. Some of them maybe had weeks or months and maybe a year or two. But either way, it wasn't a long time before they were going to die and enter into eternity. And it was either going to be with the Lord or, or it wasn't. Uh, and the time was ticking away. And, uh, and he was very concerned. Uh, you know, his grandmother knew the Lord and praised God. But he was concerned about all the other people that would be in that dining room at, at night. That's compassion. It's having a sense of what's going on in somebody else's life and what their greatest need is. In that case, it was a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's the, uh, the idea. What creates disunity, selfishness, pride, demanding our way, competition. Uh, but if we recognize and have the attitude that was in Christ, uh, that won't happen. He gives us three how-tos. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or, or vain conceit. Uh, and this needs to be our, our motive, and sometimes we need to uh, check our motives. Consider others more important. I think that's a character trait to be, be developed. Uh, you know, it's not our natural tendency to walk into Burger King uh, and have that 19-year-old gal behind the counter that's getting your french fries and think of her as more important than you. Unless you're 11 or 12 and you love french fries, then it's like, awesome, I want that job someday because I love french fries, you know? Uh, you know, see, sometimes it just depends on where we think we're at in our social order and our education and our job and who, 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 uh, who respects us and who doesn't and so forth. But, but Paul says the attitude of Jesus here was to uh, always consider others more important than, than yourselves. I remember the first time we brought David Hawking over for uh, a men's conference, and this was back in the day when you actually went out to the gate at the airport to meet him, and Kathy and I were there to meet him and his wife, Carol, and I was nervous. I mean, I'd read his books. I'd heard him on the radio for years. I, there used to be a thing called a cassette tape. You can Google later if I know what that is. It was a way in which you could listen to people uh, teach. Uh, and, uh, and I did that for years. This guy with three PhDs. What have I got to say to this guy, you know? And uh, I just want to make sure I don't get lost getting to his hotel. That was that, that the big thing there. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, we pick him up and, uh, and right away, right away, even just walking to get their luggage. By the time we got their luggage, David Hockey had me convinced this is, this is one of the greatest thrills in his life that I would take the time to spend a little bit of time with him. Because he knew how busy I was and all the things I had to do as a pastor. And that I would take the time to come out to the airport personally 
uh, to drive him to the hotel. He could hardly get over it. And uh, he was just so thrilled that I would, I didn't see that coming. You know, I didn't see that coming. Uh, he wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, well, what are we going to talk about? Uh, he, man, we just talked about the Lord and the Bible and our love for God's word and what God was doing. It was just a great time. It was a great time. And obviously, a great fellowship, and we've uh, had it back many times. But that's, what we're, that's a character trait uh, to actually be developed, I think. I don't think those things come naturally to us. Uh, Paul says, don't limit your actions to your own self-interest. Again, putting, uh, putting others first. And, and we do that a lot. Certainly we do that, again, as parents. Uh, again, if you, if you don't think you're a very selfish person, then have children. You'll, you'll learn uh, otherwise very quickly, very quickly. That, uh, man, I thought I was doing pretty good in my relationship with the Lord. I'm not. <laughs> I'm really wor- a lot more worried about me, my stuff, my time than I, I ever considered before. Uh, you know, when there's an emergency happens, where there's disaster, a fire, or whatever, you'll watch people not live for their own self-interest. You'll watch them do the opposite when there's a tremendous need. They'll rush in and they'll do and they'll help and with strangers and it doesn't matter. We just got to do something. So we really have it in us to live this life. Uh, and if we do, uh, we'll be following and having the same attitude uh, of that of, uh, of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus was like. Uh, and uh, he never lived to please himself. He lived to please his neighbor for their good, to build them up. And Paul tells us here in Romans 14 uh, that we're to follow his example. The practice is living for others. Secondly, the purpose is the praise of God. That's in verses 4 to 6. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be one mind and one mouth, glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So to accomplish the purpose, which is to glorify God, uh, we learn from the examples of the Old Testament, that the scriptures there are the Old Testament scriptures. That was the scriptures they, they had at that time. If we study them and we learn from them, the results will be hope uh, in our lives because we'll recognize, well, if we study the life of Abraham, <laughs> he didn't always do so well. But man, God sure was gracious. God sure was forgiving. God never gave up on that guy. It's amazing. Uh, and I can study that, Paul says, and I can walk away from that with a, a comfort and a patience that I need sometimes in dealing with other people. And I can have hope for my own heart to change because after all, those men and women changed, uh, and we've got something they didn't. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. Uh, we have the person of the Messiah who's already come and died and rose from the dead. We have his words. We have his teaching. Uh, we have so much more than they have. Uh, I can be encouraged so so much. Uh, when, uh, when I'm depressed or discouraged, I can go to the Psalms because David sure was, uh, and he, uh, he poured his heart out before the Lord, and I can be ministered to. Uh, through the Psalms, those examples. When I'm confused, because it seems like, uh, well, I think of uh, of Gideon in, in, in Judges 6.13, where Gideon says, uh, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening to us? <laughs> and sometimes that's the way we feel. Man, if the Lord is with us, why why is this going on in my life? But I can go to and study the story of Job and Joseph and Daniel. And I can say, you know what? I'm in the middle of the story. I don't know the end of the story. Uh, through encouragement of the scriptures, I can actually have hope and patience, uh, Paul says. Uh, and then he goes on, he says, uh, the purpose to glorify God, in that we must see that it is God who is the one who gives us patience and comforts. Now looking back at verse 4, and this is certainly no accident, Paul's use of, of these two words where he says that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, that's very clear. Now look at verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort, same phrase, grant you to be like-minded towards one another. Uh, what's the point? Uh, we can derive so much from the scripture, but we need God. <laughs> we need God to work these things uh, into our heart. We need God to reveal these things to us when we do study the Old Testament, when we study the, the scripture. Uh, we need his comfort, his patience, uh, that we might have hope. Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, it, it's saying that we'll forego. We'll forego some of our 
Christian liberties. We'll be more understanding to the weaker brother uh, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for uh, the unity within the church of Jesus Christ. We need God's help to lead us through the scriptures so we can have hope in our current situation. So we can have hope when we're not really getting along with other people that somehow God can orchestrate. It's not done. God can still work it out. And we can have hope that we won't just live lives to please ourselves. Because uh, that's, that's always bad news. Uh, always bad news. It's reasonable because Christ is our example. It's reasonable because we've got the examples of the Old Testament and it's indispensable to worship. See that verse 6? Here's our purpose that you may, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the purpose of the unity, is that God would be glorified. Uh, we'll never have true worship uh, if there's, uh, if we're all coming in here uh, worried about me, seeking to please me and nobody else. Uh, it just, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be the same, uh, the same thing. I, it is one of the things that, that I pray for all the time. And one of the things I'm thankful for, I should just say, is that uh, that is the comment that I get a lot from visitors. You know, your church isn't real big, but I can tell you, people here love each other. This is from visitors, people from the mainland. They come in, they're only in here. They see people talking, they see people praying for each other afterwards. Uh, and, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's something to be thankful for. And uh, it doesn't exist anywhere uh, everywhere, but it's something we need to, to continue to foster and develop uh, here. The goal is unity. It comes from the practice of living for others. Uh, it, the purpose of it is the praise of God. Verse 7 to 12, we have the promises of the Messiah. <clears throat> They've been fulfilled, of course, in Jesus. Paul says in verse 7, Therefore receive one another, uh, just as Christ Jesus also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, the Jews, uh, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will con I confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he uh, shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall have hope. And what Paul's doing here, of course, is he does so so uh, beautifully and brilliantly in, the, in a lot of his writings uh, referred to uh, by, uh, by rabbis as stringing pearls together. He's able to just pull and grab these little verses out of the Old Testament to make a, a central point. And, uh, and certainly we see it here first is that uh, the promises given to the Jews themselves concerning the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Where he was born, where he lived, how he died, all those prophecies, those things. But not only that, that he would come and forgive sins. Uh, he would come uh, and, uh, and, and bring comfort and hope to, uh, to the Jewish people. Have all the promises been fulfilled? No, not yet. He's still going to come. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to sit on the throne of, uh, of David uh, and so forth. But in regards to redemption and salvation and everything leading from uh, sin coming into this world to the redemption of the world, they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, he was the coming Messiah. They have been fulfilled. Notice the little phrase, has become. Jesus Christ has become the servant. He wasn't always. He was in heaven, ruling and reigning, sitting on a throne. But he left it and has become the servant. Uh, Paul's very careful in his language. He's become the servant and he's fulfilled uh, the promises made to, uh, to Israel. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we recall uh, this idea that the gospel was appropriately to go to the Jews first. Uh, the example of John the Baptist, uh, he ministered only to the nation of Israel to prepare, not the world, but just that tiny nation for the Messiah that would come. When Jesus came, it was only to the people of Israel. When he sends out the apostles on their first apostolic mission in Matthew 10, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans in or not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. After his resurrection, he tells the apostles, remain in Jerusalem. Begin your ministry there. That covers the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. It's not until chapter 8 that the gospel finally goes to the Samaritan. 
and not until Acts uh, chapter 10, we finally got Cornelius in his house being, being saved. But it all began there with the Jews. Jesus came to fulfillment of those promises. Uh, that's Paul's point here, is it begins to talk about the Gentiles, though, and string these, uh, these verses together. So secondly, the promises fulfilled then led to the Gentiles receiving the gospel. Verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, uh, as it is written. Gentile, we glorify God because of his mercy shown to, to Israel. Not to us. I mean, he eventually shows his mercy to us. We glorify God because he showed his mercy to Israel. Because they weren't so deserving, were they? In fact, as a nation, they rejected the Messiah. Uh, John 1, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But that didn't stop him. He still went to the cross and died for them. It didn't matter if the national leaders rejected him or not. We look at Israel and we're amazed at God's mercy. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, we say, if he showed mercy to them, he can show mercy to us. If he will keep his promises to them, he'll keep his promises to us. Uh, and Paul begins to lay out these scriptures to say that from the very beginning, it was always God's plan, not to save just Israel, but the whole <coughs> world, all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, truly, salvation is of the Jews, John 4, 22. But here Paul wants to make the point that because God showed them mercy, Gentiles were able to come to faith in Christ as well. Just to, uh, these are all really beautiful passages, but uh, to run through them, there's a, a beautiful progression that happens here uh, in verses 9 to 12. In verse 9, uh, Paul is quoting Psalm 18, verse 49. And notice that there, the Jews glorify God among among the Gentiles. Uh, then in verse 10, he quotes uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, and the Gentiles rejoice with the Jews. And this is uh, after uh, the deliverance out of Egypt, and they crossed the Red Sea. This is a song of Moses, Moses, the horse of the rider thrown into the sea. Sometimes uh, the kids uh, sing uh, this particular song <coughs> in, uh, in Sunday school. But the Gentiles here are seen rejoicing because the Jews have been saved uh, out of their bondage by, by the hand of God. Now, verse 11, uh, now we quote Psalm 117, verse 1, where all the Jews and the Gentiles together praise God. So we, we, we've gone from uh, the, the Jews worshiping God and praising God among, uh, and now the Jews are, are there with them, and now they're worshiping together. Verse 12, uh, in the end, uh, he quotes Isaiah 11, 10, Christ shall reign over, in the future, over Jews and Gentiles together. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool uh, progression, and again, Rabbi Paul is able to just pull these scriptures and, and weave them together to make the point that uh, God kept his promises to the nation of Israel. He'll keep his promise to us. In keeping his promises to them and showing mercy to them, it led the way to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. Gentiles were able to come to know his mercy as well. Uh, Gentiles begin as the onlooker of what God is doing. Uh, in uh, his plan of redemption with the nation of Israel, but eventually Gentiles are saved right along with it. Is, is this an issue in that church? This is an issue in that church. And now they're worshiping together, and eventually the Messiah will return, and he'll rule and reign over this world, Jews and Gentiles uh, together. Uh, it was a big problem in that church. That was the makeup of that church. Uh, he wants us to see how God's plan was to save everyone from the beginning. Accept one another, then, he says, just as Christ accepted you. How did Christ accept you? With your sin, with your prejudices, with your uh, blind spots, with your psychological shortcomings, with your stubbornness. This is how, then, we're to accept one another. Well, that guy is so stubborn. Well, how, what were you like when Christ accepted you? Well, that gal, she all, what were you like when Christ accepted you? That, that's his point. In the way that Christ accepted you, all your words and all we say, in the same way, he says to accept one another. Because the goal is unity. Uh, the practice that we get there is by living for others. It's for the praise of God. Uh, that's the purpose. Uh, the promises have been fulfilled, and therefore, we've all come to know the mercy of God. Verse 13, uh, Paul prays for unity. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing uh, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So two 
quick things to end with. Paul's prayer is to the to the God of hope. This is a very uh, Jewish expression to say the God of the God of, and then you fill it in. It means the source of. So the God of hope means God is the source of hope. Uh, that's where it's all going to come from. If I have any hope, <laughs> a living not living a life, seek simply to please me and to edify others and do it in such a way that God is glorified. Man, the hope I've got is in God. He is the source of, of a hope for us all. That's the challenge to keep our eyes on the Lord. Secondly, his prayer is that we'll actually overflow with hope. And notice it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's, that's how it's, uh, it's going to get done. Uh, and again, that, that needs to be our prayer for one another all, all the time. Uh, how will we ever be the church or the people that God's called us to be? It's only going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's why we uh, you know, have that little dub thing. It's our, uh, our little logo, you know, for uh, Calvary Chapels. It's because we're, we're trying to remember what Zachariah said. It's not my might, it's not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's the only way it'll ever get accomplished uh, in my life. Why don't we develop some good general guidelines and rules, you know, so that we'll, you know, I'll follow them if they'll follow. No, that's, that won't do it. Uh, that takes us into legalism and away from the grace of God. The two things are mutually exclusive. Uh, it's got to be a work of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, I came across an article this week from the uh, uh, Money Magazine, one of the guys sent me knew our subject matter, and it's uh, an interview with the guy that's the uh, professor at the Harvard Business School. His name is Clayton Christensen, uh, and as the article says, he's arguably one of the most influential thinkers in management uh, in the country today. Uh, 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 teaches at Harvard, written a number of books, uh, but as you'll see as I read a quote from him in a moment, he's, uh, he's had a few personal setbacks here. Uh, it has caused him to rethink his uh, view of the business world and what true success is. And he's written a new book. Uh, and again, he's not a Christian, but he's written a new book uh, in which he says, you know, the two things that are successful for a proper business model, and that is at the end of your life, do you still have your integrity and are your relationships intact? That, that's his new, new thing, trying to teach uh, uh, people in the business world. Uh, and he says this in, uh, in this interview, quote, I'll give you an analogy from my life. Four years ago, I had a heart attack. Then I was discovered to have advanced cancer that put me into chemotherapy. And then two years ago, I had a stroke. I had to learn how to speak again one word at a time. The more I focused on the problems in my life, the more miserable I was. And then somehow I realized focusing on myself and my problems wasn't making me happier. I started to say, Every day of my life, I need to find somebody else who I can help to become a better person and a happier person. Once I started to reorient my life in this direction, the happiness returned, says the non-Christian. And uh, that's certainly a lot of what uh, Paul is saying here. Uh, the goal is unity. The problem is when we disagree. Some principles to follow, but ultimately, we need to live a life that's oriented towards other people, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Amen? Let's pray. Lord. We'll meet at the river. We will be deliverers of every chain. Down into the water, children, mothers, To drown all our sins and come up again, forever changed. Never to return to the people we were before that great day.
and the moon and stars This raging war these enemies against the stronghold and the fortress of the holy
Give. What can I give to you? 